said, it's a Virginia horse. We got to get him in there. So I followed my story from there. Right hey, next guy. to Smith, had a great conversation with him. Hey, yes. guy, a recording has started, so I have to start, okay? Okay. All right. Good evening. On behalf of the Newark Public Library, welcome. I'm Tom Ankner, supervising librarian in charge of the library's Charles F. Cummings New Jersey Information Center. You're pleased tonight to be hosting this interview with the legendary sports writer Jerry Eisenberg. Jerry will be discussing his new memoir, Baseball, Nazis, and Needix Hot Dogs, Growing Up Jewish in the 1930s in Newark. Jerry is a longtime sports columnist for the Star Ledger. He will be interviewed tonight by another legend, retired Star Ledger reporter Guy Sterling. We ask that everyone keep their cameras and microphones off during the interview. If you have any questions or comments, please type them in the chat box. We will get to as many as possible at the end of the program. Now, it is my distinct honor to introduce tonight's interviewer. Guy Sterling spent almost 30 years as a general assignment reporter in Newark, retiring from the Star-Ledger in 2009. He won a national um, award for excellence in music writing and was a member of the Star-Ledger staff that won a Pulitzer Prize for breaking news reporting. Also, a story of his was used as a theme for an award-winning season of the HBO series The Sopranos, and when he left daily journalism, he was given a retirement party by the mob and a plaque for his organized crime coverage by the U.S. Justice Department. Guy was a lead reporter in the Star-Ledger's coverage of the fatal dormitory fire at Seton Hall University in 2000, stories that continued for years. They earned the paper its first ever selection as a Pulitzer Prize finalist, along with the American Society of Newspaper Editors' Jesse Laventhal Prize for Deadline News Reporting by a team in 2001. Now, here is Guy Sterling. Guy? Thank you, Tom. And good evening to everyone out there on your electronic devices. Tuning in for this Zoom discussion with legendary sports writer Jerry Eisenberg about his just published book. And many thanks to the Newark Library for serving as our host tonight. God bless the Newark Library for everything it does. Jerry really needs no introduction, so let me be brief. He's a native of Newark, born in Beth Israel Hospital, a graduate of Rutgers Newark, sports columnist of long standing with the Star Ledger and author of more than a dozen books. He's also been inducted into 17 halls of fame, 16 if, if you exclude some sort of hall of fame, football hall of fame in Alabama that's now defunct. But his greatest, greatest achievement in his mind is founding Project Pride that sent more than 1000 Newark area kids to college. At 92, Jerry continues writing and has several more books in the pipeline. Welcome, Jerry. But let me say good afternoon instead, because there's a three hour time difference between New Jersey and your home with your wife, Eileen, in Henderson, Nevada, 2,221 miles away from Newark, as you like to say. <laughs> Jerry, you've had a long and distinguished career, one in which you are probably as well known for your appearances in sports documentaries, on talk shows, and your books as you are for your columns. But this is your first book about yourself. You and I have been talking about baseball, Nazis, and Nedix hot dogs for weeks, if not months now. And this is what you told me about its release. And yes, I was taking notes, and these are your quotes verbatim. This book is selling better than anything I ever wrote. And I never had a book go crazy like this. It's also gotten great reviews. The one I like best is the one that John Lazarus had in the New Jersey Jewish News. This was one of John's lines. Jerry peppers his prose with a torrent of Yiddishisms, witticisms, freewheeling biblical allusions, progressive politics, history, and whatever else suits his muse on a particular day to get across his always unmistakable point of view. So my first two questions are these, Jerry. Why did it take you so long to write about Jerry Eisenberg? And who's going to play you in the movie? Well, uh, I rejected you as a candidate to play me, so I'll play that going <laughs> in. However, um, why did it take me so long? Well, because I had so much to say, and I intend to keep on saying it, and this was low on the priority list, very much so. OK. So for those of you who are yet to read the book, it's a personal chronology of Jerry's life from his infancy 
until he graduates from college and heads off for military service during the Korean War, roughly the first 21 years of his life, warts and all, and there are plenty of warts. But the level of recall is incredible. Names of teachers, neighbors, classmates, et cetera. If you're taking Prevagen, Jerry, you surely should be featured in one of its commercials. Not all the story plays, takes place in Newark, and a recurring theme throughout the book is that you love poking your finger in the eye of, of authority, consider defiance a high virtue, and march to your own drummer. Did you ever stop to consider where this trait came from? Is it genetic, a learned behavior, both, neither, or what? I think it was more defensive than anything else because I was on the radio recently and a guy said, well, how can you keep on writing columns at 92? And I said, well, well, he said, you're the dean of American comics. And I said, well, I hate to be the one to tell you the other guys died. So it, it's by default. But um, the thing that kept me going probably was venom, a search for the truth, and something that, something that I'm very presumptuous of me to include myself. But I was bar mitzvahed in, uh, in, at Temple Ben Abraham in the corner of Shanley Avenue and Clinton Avenue. The rabbi was Rabbi Joachim Prince, who was the warm-up speaker for Martin Luther King on the, on the mall, and who himself had ridden the first freedom bus to South to Alabama. However, he taught me something, hammered it into me. Um, in Hebrew, it's uh, lakun alam, lakun alam, which means fix the world. And the theory is, which is never going to happen, but we can try. The theory is if everybody does something toward that on the same day, problems end. Well, problems aren't going to end. Everybody's not going to do it on the same day. But the quest for it, the quest, that's what's important. I never cared whose eye I stuck my finger in if I was doing the right thing. So let's talk a little bit about your father, Jerry, since he plays such a lead role in the book and certainly played a lead role in your life. He and his family were Jewish immigrants from Lithuania, who you say walked to Hamburg to get a boat to the US and then settled first in Patterson. Harry was a baseball fanatic who didn't know the game in Europe, but took to it readily here as an activity where he was more than adept from the first time he swung a bat in the playground, which won him the acceptance and even admiration of his schoolboy peers. He played pro ball as a second baseman in the low minor leagues, as you write, and he obviously passed his passion for the game along to you as his only son. While you describe him as a good hit, no field player, sadly, your game could only be described as no hit, no field. But it doesn't seem as though that, that you let him down and that, really, and that that really affected your relationship. Is that a correct reading of your relationship with him? Uh, it's my relationship had many strategies with my father, many layers, but uh, you're very close to the truth. He loved the game so much. I'll never forget the day he took me for my first baseball glove. Uh, we used to play catch in the alley and uh, till I was 10. And hey, Jer hey Jerry, uh, hey, Jerry, yes. we're being asked to, uh, uh, somebody asked that you speak a little more, a little more loudly, okay? Is this better? Um, yeah, I can hear you fine. Uh, is that okay, Stephen? You're you saying, is that is that better? Yeah, you can also turn on the captions too if you're having trouble hearing. I'm saying that to the people who are watching. Okay, I'm sorry for interrupting. Go ahead. No, Jeff. no, that's fine. I, I certainly would love to be heard. Um, anyway, uh, he said I had to earn the baseball glove. So I'm ten, and it's a blizzard, a near blizzard. We used to have a lot of blizzards in those days. And uh, I'm in the, standing in the living room. I don't know why. I have a, my, my Mackinac on. It's the, it's the same picture that's on the cover of the book. I got on knickers and long stockings. And, and anyway, and a muffler wrapped around me. And my mother comes in and she says, well, where was he going? What is this? And my father said, we're going out. She said, where are you crazy? We should look, at, look outside. No. And he said, we have important business today. So we walked to the corner and we can hear the buses because the chains are all broken. They didn't have snow tires and they're banging on the pavement. We can hear it before we see it. We get downtown, the biggest department store, or a sports book store. 
we walk in, there's a barrel of gloves in the, right in the lobby. And he picks them up and he starts smelling them one by one. And he says to me, this is the glove that you will play with. And right in the course, the heel of the glove, it's endorsed by a ball player. And the ball player is named Jimmy Gleason. And he's the left fielder on the North Bears. Now I'm in heaven. I got a North Bears glove. No one will stop me. We, 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 he's explaining on the bus how you're going to wrap it in each foot oil and put a baseball in a pocket and tie it up. And you, we're not going to use it till the spring. And he looks at me and he says, ah, the hell with it. Come on, let's go. We go outside with no coats in the blizzard and you're throwing a ball back and forth. My mother's banging on a kitchen window. She says, stop, you'll, you'll kill my only son. What are you doing? And my father says, I can't hear her. Can you? And now I'm in a conspiracy. And I say, no, I can't either. Then he throws the ball as high as he can. I'm circling under the ball. I keep thinking, Jimmy Gleason, I'm Jimmy Gleason. We're playing for the International League Champion. If I don't get this ball, the Bears will lose. I'm looking up and all I can see is snowflakes. Well, I can't pick the ball out from the strikes. It is. And suddenly I lunge forward. It hits in my glove and it stays there. And I look over at him and he's smiling. And I realize now that was the day he gave me a gift that stayed with me, several gifts, the love of baseball, the love of competition, and the love of my father. Jerry, you're also right about Harry's job in a plant that dyed animal pelts for use in coats. And you say the work ultimately, ultimately led to health problems and his death. My father had an uncle who worked in a leather factory on Freeland Heisen Avenue and who came home each day looking as though he just stepped out of a coal mine. It must have been a strange and difficult sight for a young boy seeing his father exposed to such dangerous elements day after day after day. I get the sense you knew, you knew at the time that this wasn't healthy and that things weren't going to end up good for him. Is that correct? Well, I had a hint of it. You know, he's try, trying to grow up and he was always there. And I, I just discounted that he was ever, ever going to get sick and he was ever going to die. And it, that's just the way it was. But um, he, I would tell you, he said something to me when he died, which stayed with me all my life. And it's got a little bit of, he didn't, he was not religious. He was not a ritualistic Jew. He was a cultural Jew. And I only saw him in temple twice, my bar mitzvah and his funeral. But he was a lot like, the fix the world kind of guy. And um, this is what he tried to impart on me. We all have obligations. We all have things we have to do. I was 10 years old, Family Avenue. He says to me, go outside and sweep the sidewalk. I sweep the sidewalk. Why would you sweep the sidewalk? People walk on it. I didn't realize he swept it every Saturday until I got big enough to sweep it. So I'm out there sweeping it. He's standing in front of the house with his arms folded. I know I'm doing something wrong, but I don't know what it is. And he looks at me, he says, what are you going to do now? I said, well, now I want to try to play baseball. And it's Saturday. And he said, don't worry about that. You know that's not the Eisenberg garbage. That's the city of Newark garbage. And you know our garbage cans are in the back of the house. And you know there's a dustpan in the house. So go get it, move the garbage, and throw it in the cans where it belongs. Then you play baseball. I said to him, why? He looked at me. He was not a hitter or a shatter, but I think he considered in that moment. And then he said, I'm going to tell you why. Because this will be the answer for as long as you live under my roof. They used to have all the saloons. He never said bars. All the saloons had free lunch. And the free lunch was a loss leader. It brought people into the bar. And they made up for the money they lost on their lunch. And they didn't lose much on their lunch. They didn't have much. But the liquor and the beer paid for it. He said, and then one day, they said, we don't have to do that. These people drink anyway. And one by one, it ended. And then he looked at me, and he did what he always did. He got a hand on each shoulder, and bent down, and looked me in the eye, and he said, OK. The last bar saloon to do that was the White Rose Bar. The White Rose Bar is closed. Ain't no more free lunch in America. Go put the garbage where it belongs. And every time I opened my mouth, I got that as an answer. Jerry, in addition to your poignant story about the uh, first baseball glove that your father got you, you have a, a hilarious account of 
of trying to take up the manly art of self-defense in a gym under the oh. tutelage of one Georgie Kornfeld that ended disastrously. Would you recount that for us, please? Yeah, it did. It, it, that wasn't in the gym. That came later. But George, I, I had to walk home past Blessed Sacrament Church and School. And I, it must have been in triple digits how many fights I lost in front of Blessed Sacrament. Fortunately, all those kids' fights in those days were fist fights. But I wasn't very good. I come home one day and I got a black eye and my father says, that's it. Stay home Saturday. Doorbell rings Saturday. And there's a guy there with a crooked nose and two cauliflower ears. And I'm thinking to myself, he must be the truant officer because he knew my name. And I was cutting grammar school to go sneak into Newark Bears ballpark and watch baseball. My father comes out, goes in the closet, comes out with a pair of boxing gloves, hands him the Georgia and says, Go down to the cellar. We had a basement, not a cellar. Go down to the cellar, and he doesn't come up till he can defend himself. Well, I go downstairs, and he puts the gloves on me. He said, they feel good. You're okay? I said, yeah, I'm fine. Bing. He steps on my toe, elbows me in my ribs, slaps me three times in my face. I don't know what's going on. He said, I'm not here to teach you how to box. I'm here to teach you how to fight. Well, when I came up in the basement, I wanted to have a fight. I, I, I figured my system might be a good start, but I didn't think my father would go for that. So Monday, I'm walking home slowly with this newfound knowledge. And there's about 12 kids in front of the school. And there he is. There he is. And I say, OK, who's first? And the first guy was bigger than me. And he steps in front of me. I kick him in the shin. I elbow him in the ribs. I slap him three times. And he goes down the front, and he's crying. I said, oh, well, next. And before I got next out of my mouth, I woke up. There's 10 guys in line. I said, I'm not that good. I said, Pete, don't fail me. I went home very proudly, told my father of how I stood up for myself. I never told him about the crack star part. So your first home in Newark was on Baldwin Avenue, but the Eisenberg family later moved to a home that your father bought for $6,000 at 80 Shanley Avenue, where you spent your youth. In a strange real way in the book, the house is also seems like it's a character. Could you describe it for us and your neighborhood? Well, the neighborhood was, everybody, look, I was not, I, my parents did the best they could with me. I was born in 1930 when the depression was really in high gear and, but they were fine. But I was raised by the people in the neighborhood, the cop on the beat, who had a lot to do with me. And Father Fitzgerald, I think his name was, in the Blessed Sacrament. One day, by mistake, I threw a, a ball through the, um, the window where he lived, right next to the church. And it was an elderly teacher. She was a nun hanging out the window. And she's saying, Father Fitzgerald, he did it. That one, the boy down there with the stockings and the knickers, he did it. And he came downstairs, took me by the ear, and he's pulling me down the street by the ear. And he gets to the door and rings the bell, and he won't let go of my ear. And my dad opens the door, and Father Fitzgerald says, I think, Mr. Eisenberg, this belongs to you. He said, yes, he does. And I got a push, and I wound up in the room. My father pushed me against the wall, and I fell down. I said, why are you doing that? We're not even Catholic. He said, we're doing it because on this block, we all live together. And tomorrow you will apologize. And I will loan you 75 cents. And you'll go to the supermarket delivering groceries. And you will pay me back. And uh, he was a man of great honor and great cooperation. And uh, he, you know, I was really a rotten kid. So I would never with my parents. but. Not so good with my sister, terrible with my teachers, horrible. In the third grade, I fell in love. Her name was Anita Richter, and she had long braids, and I had to get her attention. We had desks in those days, the top lifted up, and the important stuff went in the desk, a half-eaten bologna sandwich, half-chewed gum, stuff like that. But in the top of the desk, there was an inkwell. I took her right braid and dipped it in the ink. Well. She screamed, I ducked, 
And Miss Van Hess, who was way overweight, my third grade teacher, came up and slapped me in the face three times because in those days you were allowed to do that. And I got my revenge because I was that kind of a rotten kid. She fell on the ice and broke her leg. She's home in a cast. And we get a teacher. And kids salivate in those days when they know they're going to have a substitute who doesn't know what the class is doing. Well, where are we in English class? I don't know. Well, where are we in history? Well, we don't know. Well, where are we? We don't know. We don't know. We don't know. Okay, we're going to do something. To start. We're all going to write notes to Miss Van Hest. Get well, please. We love you as a teacher. Well, not Jerry. Jerry writes a note and it says, roses are red, violets are blue. I've had lousy teachers, but never like you. And then because I felt I was invincible, I signed the thing. And what I signed was your student, Jerry Eisenberg. So there was no doubt she got, and that was a, that most hellish year I ever spent in grammar school deservedly. So in 1938, as an eight-year-old, you came upon anti-Semitic graffiti in Newark for the first time. Could you tell us about that experience and the ways you experienced other forms of anti-Semitism and the rise of Nazism in your formative years? When did you realize this was more than one individual's personal gripe and that it was a real and continuing problem on a local, national, national and international scale? Your father seems to have been key in this understanding as the cover of the book indicates in a so subtle way with an illustration of you and him with the marquee of Newark's newsreel theater in the background. That's correct, right? Yes. And I was eight and he took me to the newsreel. The week before the Nazis held a Bund, German American Bund rally in Madison Square Garden, 20,000 sympathizers, big swastikas, George Washington's cut out up to the ceiling, and um, 12 of them, 12,000 of them dressed as stormtroopers. And my father insisted I see the films of this. He took me down there, we went in the newsreel, and we're coming out now. My father was wounded in World War I, and uh, he says to me, those mumsers, which in Yiddish means bastards. I helped stop them in 1917, 1918. We got to stop them now. I'm eight years old. I look at him and I say, but dad, aren't they in Berlin? And he said, no, they're here. He was speaking about the fact that we lived about 15 blocks from the Irvington North border. And there was a sizable Jewish population in, in, in Newark in those days. And across the line in Irvington was a regional headquarters of the German American Bund. And traffic between adults even was very violent in those days. And that was the first time. But, the, but what happened the same year, I see uh, written on the sidewalk, I could see the sidewalk now, part of it was tilted, not repaired. And in blue chalk, someone had written, all Jews are kites. Well, I knew I couldn't fly. I didn't know much at eight, but I knew I couldn't fly. I couldn't be a kite. So I went to him, I said, what is that? And he said to me, the word is kite. And there are a lot of other words. And he told me those words. And he said, if, if someone says that someone else called you like that, doesn't count. Someone's got to say it to your face because people will lie. But if it happens that way, you look at him and you smile so he relaxes and you hit him with the best right hand you can throw. And if you don't finish with the left hook, don't come home. That same year, smelling Fort Lewis at the supper table. My father, the supper table was my father's pulpit. He decided what the subject would be and he alone. And there were two topics you were safe ground. You could talk baseball, that was the year of Hank Greenberg who hit 58 home runs, or you could talk Nazis and Germans and German American boys. You want to talk about something else, you had to get permission. And that night he said, that day at night, he said, supper, he says, okay, all the other all three of you, you're going to come down, my mother, my sister, and me. You're going to sit in the living room tonight, and we're going to listen to the Schmeling Lewis fight. And he explained to me, he was wrong about this, because Max Schmeling was not a Nazi. He was just a German who had knocked out Lewis once and wanted to win the title. Lewis was not fighting for America, as Franklin Roosevelt, the president, claimed. 
He was fighting because this guy had knocked him out two years earlier and he wanted his revenge. But it became an us against them kind of thing. And with heightened attention, the morning of that fight, 22 German Americans were arrested as spies for Nazi Germany. Well, in New Yorkville was a hot, but uh, the New Yorkville section was a hot bed of, of um, pro Hitler people. And the Jews were, not, were on the other side. And I thought there was going to be a much bigger fight after the, the fight, but there wasn't. My father's on his feet. He's throwing punches and he's screaming at the radio because there's no television. And he's cursing every three words. So I'm on my feet and I'm throwing punches and I start to curse. And my mother grabs me by the shoulder and she says, language, young man, language. I will not have that in my house. Anyway, he knocked him out in the first round. But 30 some odd years later, something like that anyway, I'm in the all black town of Grambling, Louisiana, home of Grambling University, which was an all black college. And I'm talking to the guy who runs the men's store. And for some reason, we get on a boxing and I tell him my Lewis Schmeling story. And he says, I took you around the corner to talk to the barber and meet the people. That's Gallo's Barbershop. I watched, I listened to it, there was television then. I listened to the same fight as your dad and you in the back room of Gallo's. The difference was your dad was home. We couldn't go home because when Lewis won, the Klan was out riding. And that night, he said to me, did your dad curse? I said about every third word, he said, yeah, I want to tell you, I'm a black man. He was a white man. I never met him. He never met me. But I'll tell you, that night, he and I were brothers under the skin. And that taught me a little bit about America. You have one of your memorable lines, your memorable Jerry Eisenberg lines that stuck with me as I read the book about how you almost fell flat on your face carrying the Torah on some stairs during your bar mitzvah ceremony. You say, and this is a quote, you negotiated the first three steps with the grace of Sonny Liston playing the lead in Swan Lake. Now, I remember seeing Sonny Liston as a kid jump rope on the Ed Sullivan show, drumming up publicity for one of his fights. But that memory has now been supplanted in my mind with an image of a scowling Sonny Liston in a fancy leotard doing a pirouette on toe shoes. Thank you for that, Jerry. And speaking of Sonny Liston, your writing often gravitates to those who challenge authority, aren't accepted by society, or who are viewed as misfits or outcasts. Is this the ingrained rebel in you seeking out your own kind? I think that's a very, uh, I, I, nobody else has done that. And I give you credit for your homework. That's an accurate analysis. Yes, I, I, I well, see, Sonny was interesting to me because he was the last mafia-owned fighter, uh, heavyweight, the last one. When Ali knocked him out, that liberated all the heavyweights to the extent that they might be partially owned by a mob guy, but the mob couldn't tell them what to do. Sonny, uh, I'll tell you a funny thing about it. Sonny was always a mystery. And Sonny, uh, I always got along with guys like that. George Foreman was a very dear friend of mine. Uh, he was as bad as Mike Tyson and Sonny combined when he was a young man. He grew up, uh, the other two, I don't know, Mike did too, but uh, I can't say it's Mike for Sonny. But, but I liked Sonny because there was mystery about him. He didn't know how old he was. He didn't know when he was born. And when he died came the biggest mystery of all. I went to look at his grave for a book I was doing. I found the grave, there were four pennies in the shape of a rectangle, an American flag and a bouquet of artificial flowers. So I took the cemetery director with me. I said, what is the flag for? She said, well, it was Memorial Day and we figured almost everybody was in the service. I said, does the Missouri State Penitentiary count toward that? So obviously that was one thing. We didn't know, and the pennies would go, uh, go back to an old custom, where pennies were put on the graves of people for the ferryman at the river sticks. So he took them toward paradise rather than to hell. Or, and the third thing was who put the flowers there? He had no relatives here anymore. Who put the flowers and nobody knew. And to this day, I would like to know. <clears throat> okay, let's skip on to another subject. Uh, school at any level didn't seem to have much meaning for you. 
especially when it came to courses that involved numbers. But you found music at the Avon Avenue School in Newark and not only realized you liked it, but also could be good at it. As an aside, you identify the school's band instructor as Mr. Simon, who could have been Paul Simon's father, who was a teacher in the Newark school system. Wow. And you carried that love of music throughout high school and beyond, becoming proficient on several instruments and for a while thinking that music could be a career. You also write that what you learned from music had a profound effect on your writing. Would you elaborate, please? Certainly. It's meter. When I, even when I was a young snot and I was learning this business, I would fight with editors. You can't change that word. Well, what do you mean? I'm giving you a better word. You might be giving me a better word, but it interferes with the meter and the rhythm of the sentence. And if I can stop you, I will. Music became a lot to me. There's a chapter, I wrote my autobiography much too young. I was, I don't know, about 77 when I wrote it. And um, there was a chapter in it which I call the sounds of sports. And I, and I put that together with music. I could tell you, and, and most people who really watch baseball, not the World Series crowd, Spencer crowd, but the people who watch baseball, they can identify the sound of a home run when it comes off the bat. And that to me is music. Music and writing go together. I'll quote a song for you uh, about Manhattan. The, the, the rumble of a subway crane, the rattle of a taxi, the debutantes who entertained at Angelo's and Maxi, which was a restaurant. There's so much meter and so much rhythm in that center. If I could, if I could sentence, if I could capture that in everything I wrote, I think I might be pretty good. I might have written an opera. <laughs> <laughs> Until they read this book, not many of your fans are going to know that you didn't go to high school in Newark as your older sister Lois did at Wequaic, but in Virginia at the Augusta Military Academy. Except for your involvement in the band and school paper called The Bayonet, it didn't seem exactly a pleasant experience for you. Your parents sent you there with the hope you'd become more responsible, and that really didn't seem to work out much either. I know you write that you were a handful growing up, maybe two handfuls, but was there one incident in your life where your parents, who come across as very loving and very protective, when it came to you, particularly your mother, when they told themselves, this is a straw that's broken the camel's back with your behavior? It wasn't one incident. It was I declared war on the Newark public school system, and <laughs> I lost every battle I ever had. I mean, I, I had... I, the Yiddish word mazel, I had no luck. There was the girl with the braids. Then there was a girl, um, much later I met in the schoolyard, she was older than I was. I was like older women. And I took her to the movies. I got fresh in the movies. She slapped me. She didn't want to give up the ticket. So she watched the rest and didn't think. I found out on Monday that her mother was my sixth grade teacher. And that made for a very good year in school. Uh, I just kept looking for trouble. And, and if I didn't, trouble always found a way to find me. <laughs> Did your parents envision that going to a um, military high school might lead to a career in the military for you? No, but my father wouldn't have objected. He was, he was wounded in World War I. But no, no, it, and, and I don't want to give away the end of the book, but you'll understand my father in the last. I'll do period. that a little later, Jerry. Okay. So anyway, uh, the thing was that, the, first of all, they didn't have any money to send me to military school to begin with. I had an aunt, Tanta Annie, and she had no children. And whatever my father didn't have money for, she, she went to the Underground Railroad, which was my mother, because if my father knew it was coming for her, he wouldn't have taken it. My mother, when it comes to time for military school, my mother says to him, you know, the first supermarket in Newark opened around the corner on 10th Street. And you wouldn't believe the amount, a year ago, you wouldn't believe the prices. Harry, I saved this much money. And if he can get some kind of a work combination, he ought to be able to go to school, military school, and maybe they can teach him to grow up. My father believed that she had saved the money, actually, Every time my aunt slipped her money, it was in a big vase on a top shelf so none of us could reach it. 
uh, and she gave it to him and he, he didn't know it. He wouldn't have taken it if it was mine. He sent me there for four years. I hated that place, but I never told him that because it, it taught me what, I went back on the 60th anniversary of my high school graduation for one reason and one reason only. I was a keynote speaker and all they were waiting for a lovely welcome home, warm heart speech. I told them what I thought of that school. <laughs> And I said to them, I still owe this school a major debt for one thing. Every time you guys told me I couldn't, I did, or I tried to. And that stayed with me. That was your graduation <laughs> gift to me. <laughs> and it was a little bit of anti-Semitism down there. Well, I'm going to ask you that in a moment. Um, while we're on the subject of Augusta military, there's an image you provide that needs a little further explanation. <clears throat> it's one I still can't fully fathom. It's the one about the commandant of the school setting up a folding chair for himself in the middle of the field during football games and sitting there, encourage his team to take the ball to big boy. Can you help me see that a, a bit clearer in my mind? I I've never you, heard of anything like it. I can help you see it. He was outrageous. I didn't like <laughs> him. He didn't like me. But when they would chant, take the ball to big boy, I would add, shove it up his ass. And, and, I was always caught saying it, you know, I was always in trouble. You had in military school, you have penalty tours, like at VMI or West Point. You have to walk a rectangle in front of the school, no matter what the weather is, rain, snow, whatever. And in our school, Monday was a day off. And Monday you could hitchhike into town, Stanton, Virginia, and you could do uh, whatever you wanted to and, and hitchhike back or take the school bus back. I got to see Stanton three times in four years, because every Monday I was walking off penalty tours. So I was not what you call a model cadet. And, and I just, I disliked that guy intensely. And he wasn't too crazy about me. Mm -hmm. So from Augusta military, you come back to Newark and go to uh, Rutgers Newark in a former uh, brewery building on Rectories, Rector Street in downtown. You're writing for the school newspaper, The Observer, eventually become its editor. And this seems to me a pivotal point in your life because it led, one, to your getting a degree you thought you'd never get and maybe didn't even want at one point. Two, meeting three of the most influential men in your life beyond your father, Dean of Students Edwin Duran, Athletic Director Hank Bodner, and History Professor Henry Blumenthal. Three, Getting a job at the Star Ledger, where you met your lifetime mentor and friend, the wonderful Sid Dorfman. Four, finally realizing you were heading where you were heading in life with a newspaper career. And five, a marriage. Am I overstating this? No, uh, some of the details are a little, little hard on me, but I made up my mind when I was going to write the book, I was going to tell the truth. Um, well, I had three fathers in my life my dad, who nobody could ever, ever replace. Then when I got in the newspaper business, an editor named Stanley Woodward, Stanley Woodward took seven years of Latin and Greek at Amherst. If we're gonna have a mentor, that's the kind of mentor you wanna have. And the third one, where I was covering a lot of boxing, a trainer had asked a friend of mine to please introduce me to him. His name was Ray Arcel. At that time, he held a record of 22 world champions. And until Ray died, we were very, very close. If you went to his apartment, you wouldn't know what he did for a living. There were paintings, there were sculptures, nothing about boxing on the walls. They were, they were important to me. Then the guy who changed me a little bit, not enough, the person who changed me all the way was my wife, but that's my third wife. My first wife, there was a civil war in my house. She was not Jewish. I was going to marry her. I told everybody I was going to marry her. My mother was angry at me. I was angry. I wasn't angry at my mother. I was trying not to hurt her and trying not to hurt the girl I wanted to marry. I didn't marry her. So you, I, would, I did finally, but you won't read about it in the book because I went off during the Korean War and came back and then I married her. But it, that marriage did not work out at all. Uh, but I became a single father. And the gift she gave me were two beautiful children who today uh, are, are marvelous people. And then I married a second time because a social worker threatened to take my children away from me. And that didn't, that only, ran, that was just, both of us was a marriage of convenience. So three years, four years, most, and that was that. 
But in the meantime, how I got the degree is important. I worked at night, four or five nights a week in a chemical plant, went to school in the morning and then did my homework in, in the library where you people are right now, even if you're there electronically. And finally, um, I would meet myself going out. You know, I, I, I come home at one and seven, I'm on my way to the bus. And anyway, the chemical plant blew up. I had no income except some money, you know, hustling money I made, hustling at the mosque, doing things like that. I knew I didn't have enough money for my senior year. So my junior year, which was paid for, I had that. I, and I, of course, I lived at home, so I could have raised the money, but I didn't have a job capable of raising the money at that point. So I go back to the Observer, the school paper, and I'm going to take a big box. I'm cleaning out my desk to leave the school forever. We were in the cellar of an old home right across the street from the Arts and Science Building. To get to the arts, you had to kick the door open. I mean, it was a terrible place. But we had fun, and we and I had a lot of fun because I had my college career figured out. 45% of my college career in the Observer office, 45% of it around the corner in a bar called The Place, and if I had time, part of the 10% in class. Well, I was not a great student. The door gets kicked open, I'm putting this stuff away, I turn around, and it's the Dean of Student Leads, Edward M. Durant. This guy always wore a suit and a five minute cap and key. We were different people. And he said to me, uh, well, he said, I understand. Uh, do you mind if I interrupt you? And me and my charming voice said, yeah, you just did. He, he said, well, they tell me you're not coming back. And I said, yeah, I'm not coming back. I don't have any people in front of you. You want me to pay you to educate me. And he, neither, neither is going to work very well. He said, well, I tell you, I think you're making a big mistake. But I compliment you on what you did with this newspaper. You criticized me for high tuition. I never corrected you. I have nothing to do with your tuition. But I think you made a professional paper for us. So I want to tell you, you can come back. And I said, how? And he said, your senior year is on me. I couldn't believe it. Now, they were new. Rutgers had taken them over in 45. This was 1948. I didn't believe they had funds, you know, scholarship funds and stuff. I just didn't believe it. So he, I believe he probably went into his pocket for it. And I said to him, how can you do this? And he said, I play the market. I make money sometimes, and sometimes I make a bad investment. I'm going to find out what kind of investment you are, one way or the other. And after that, he would wave to me in school, but never say another word. I wonder today what he would think of his investment. I just, I don't know. But that got me to go to class and it got me, it got me everything but a, a grown up relationship with other people. I'm sure he would have thought that it was a great investment. Um, you end the book with an image of your father and you standing in front of the induction center on Broad Street as he was on the, his way to work and you were heading off to the mil uh, for military service. You'd taken the bus together down from Shanley Avenue. You write that was it was the only time you ever saw your father cry. Was this because he was fearing for you based upon his own wartime experience where he signed up for duty the same day the US entered World War I and was later wounded in France? Or do you think it was because he finally realized that you'd left the foolishness behind and had become a man? Or maybe these were tears of joys that you were finally getting the hell out of Dodge and he'd have some peace. No, I think, I, I really do think uh, he was wounded in World War I and he was worried. And when I finally got my orders to go overseas, he actually had a heart attack and that later killed him. Uh, I was home by then, but it, it killed him. But I remember something he said, the last thing we ever, last thing he ever, you know, the only time we ever spoke about death. He lived across the street from me. And I went to see him one day and it was, it, it, we, he, we knew he was gonna die. We didn't know when, and he wasn't in bed, but he said, hey, come in the bedroom, I wanna show you something. He said, open up the closet door, what do you see? I said, well, a sport jacket, a couple of pairs of pants, a pair of shoes, some shirts, not much else. He walks over and he puts his arm around me and he says, okay. 
And then he turns and faces me and like he'd have done every time I got in trouble when I was a little kid, put a hand on each shoulder, looked me and it seemed like it was an hour, it was about 10 minutes silence. And he said, okay, now you know, I have nothing to leave you but my good name. I'm sure you won't, but don't screw it up. He didn't say screw. And uh, it, it influences me today. I, 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 I hope he would approve of it. I hope I've lived the life he'd approve of. Final question this evening, Jerry, for me before we open up the floor. You characterize Newark in the book as, and this is your quote, the city that Norman Rockwell never painted. As someone whose family history in Newark dates to 1860 and who has owned a home in Newark since 1986, I get what you mean. But the fact is, and tell me if I'm wrong, that you still enjoy a love affair with Newark, even if it's from afar, and it's one that will last the rest of your life. And who knows, maybe you'll expound upon it again in the sequel to this book that everyone hopes is coming. Well, the, it's a great question. I love this city. You have to remember, I'm not knocking the city as it is today. Everything has goes through changes and growth. And downtown Newark is starting to resemble, part of it is starting to resemble what it was when I was growing up. But I will tell you this, that city in those days had 410,000 people. And it was, as such cities are, it was the ultimate factory town. Every, every adult I knew worked in a factory somewhere. And like I said, I was raised by the people in the neighborhood. I loved the neighborhood. I, and it was an exciting city. We actually had harness racing in Weekly Park. We had, we used to call it the tub of blood. We had Laurel Garden. You couldn't fight in Madison Square Garden until you had fought in, in Laurel Garden and proven yourself. We also had the Newark Armory. We had the ballpark, the Bears ballpark. I saw Zale fight Graziano in that park. Um, we had the Newark Bears and we had the Newark Eagles. We had a Newark football team called the Newark Bears, not the one that younger people remember, but the, this team was owned by the Chicago Bears. And I saw Marty Glickman, the great announcer and great sprinter who was kept out of the Olympics by Avery Bondage because he was Jewish. I saw Marty Glickman uh, play football for the Jersey City Giants. Uh, we had high school football in the same building, City Stadium, which has been replaced now. Uh, triple headers every Saturday. And it was funny, you'd see a band rush in, another band rush out after the game, people. It, it was a city. I saw my first opera sitting on the grass at school stadium. It was, it was uh, Carmen. Uh, there was so much. In my, my, my wife says, my wife came from Montclair. There's a little bit of rivalry there that I never participated in, and she didn't really either, but there was a little bit of rivalry in terms of there was more money in Montclair, there was more this, more that, and, and I was growing up during the Depression. She did not. And she said to me, that Newark that you love so much is dead. I mean, it's not bad, but it's, it's different, it's gone. I said, honey, let me tell you something. It will never disappear because it's got a place forever. As long as this blood is pumping it, as long as this brain is working, that Newark is alive in me. Beautiful, Jerry, thank you. And we hope that you continue writing and uh, we'd love to hear what happened in your life after, uh, after you turned 21 and went into the military. So uh, Tom, if you can open up the floor to uh, our viewers to see if anyone has uh, some questions. Uh, yeah, so okay. Yeah, thanks, Guy. We have a, a comment and a question so far. Uh, Bill May is, says, uh, listening to Mr. Eisenberg's experience growing up Jewish in Newark, I'm reminded of Warren Grover's book, Nazis in Newark. You know, probably at least in part because it's the same era, right? Oh, it yeah. is the same era. Yeah. You know, you know, in fact, when I was two years old, and I didn't know it, my father made sure I knew it when I got to be eight and nine, there was a great animosity on either side of that Irvington Newark line, with Bundes and Jews. And they fought in the street and the mayors had to, had to settle everybody down. Um, 
I read the book, it's very well done. And there's another one in similar era, very well done. Um, it, it was some kind of an influence. When I think of Newark, I don't think of that anymore. Because I, you know, I was such a little, I don't want to use the word I wanted to use, but I was a bad kid, never to my parents ever, uh, and never to my sister, but but to all my teachers, to, I, and I was a, much of a loner in many ways. Uh, I just feel that um, that city tolerated me and that city raised me. In fact, I think the dedication in the book is to both the city and the faith that raised me. And if, if there's such a thing as time travel, I wouldn't want to leave it now unless I could take my wife and kids with me. <laughs> but if I had to go back, that's the place I'd want to go to. Oh, okay. There's a, also a question from Julissa Beltran. Um, what are your thoughts on the declining or rather the very small population of Jewish residents of Newark today? What is this decline attributed to, do you think? Well, I know it's attributed to it's a little thing called a riot helps speed it up. Mm -hmm. And before that, uh, it, they were looking for um, a place, you know, they, they, they couldn't move out of Newark in the beginning. There was nowhere to go. And then I think they discovered South Orange and West Orange. And the thing about that, which I will throw in gratuitously here, at the end of each Yom Kippur each year, the junior Hadassah would have an affair, I believe at the Essex House or Symphony, somewhere here in Newark, a dance. And as luck would have it, it might have been God's judgment on the Jews that ran away from Newark. They only had daughters, it seemed. And they still had to come back to Newark to date the thugs to go to the, to the affair. Uh -huh. And I conquered that a little bit by putting a hard-boiled egg in my pocket, taking three other good friends of mine that weren't Jewish, paying my my dollar admission that there was no such thing as an parade raised. It took a stamp, bing, bing, paid on your thing. Then I went to the men's room, peeled the egg, rolled it across the, the, the ink, and then put it on the, the hand of each guy. So we beat them out of uh, $3. They only got one from me. But, but uh, it, it's, the city is just, it meant so much to me and it, it taught me so much. And I roamed the city a lot as a loner. I, I, I don't mean when I'm older, but I mean, as a kid, 10, 11, you could do it, go wherever you want. Nobody bothered you. And um, my memories are, are just absolutely great. I did have one grammar school teacher that was a real teacher. Her name was Miss Lee Joy. I was in trouble in the third grade. Always oh, I had trouble. That's when I put Anita's hair in the ink oil and whatever. So we're walking down. It's the first day of school the next time. And they have to hold it, each other's hands. Are we going to get the good, easy teacher from the fourth grade or the hard, meanie from the fourth grade? There were two teachers. And we walked. It's a ritual. We walked down the hall. We're getting the good one. She opens the door. This is Miss Fran has. Opens the door. And she says, Miss Rejoy, I'm giving you the greatest, smartest, well-behaved, most well-behaved third grade I have ever taught, except for this one. Bing, she shoves me into the room. She said, don't worry about him. He'll be in the reformatory and roll away before the school year is over. <laughs> well, one day, Miss Rejoy comes in, and uh, she's teaching the walking teacher. And she sees me reading a book under the desk, teaching, walking, stopping. You stay up to school. Well, I did that every day. It was no big deal. She comes and she says to me, give me the book. I give her the book. The book was called The Robe. I was nine years old. It, made, it became a very famous movie. It was written by a guy named Lloyd Douglas. She said, why are you reading this? I said, because it's interesting. She said, tell me the plot. I did. It was about Jesus crucifixion. She said, well, where did you get the book? I said, I got it out of my mother's bookcase. Did you have permission? No, I didn't have permission. Well, why would you dare do it? Well, because... See, my mother has this big empty bookcase and she joined the Book of the Month Club. She gets books in there, so she looks like she's smart. And then she'll resign when your bookcase is filled. She said, I'll tell you what, we've got a deal. You can read that book in the open when your work is done and everybody else is still working. And when you finish, you bring me another book. I approve it. We do the same thing. 
I read four books that year. She had a tremendous influence on me. Okay. All right. Well, I, I have a question. Um, I love the title of the book. Um, where did it come from? It came from that morning, mm -hmm. walking out of the Newsreel Theater. You can see the yeah. Newsreel in the back. Yeah. yeah. Number one, um, baseball was that was my father's love, and that's what we talked yeah. about. Nazis, you know that part already. And Nedix, as we're walking down, and he makes the statement, we got to stop him. He looks at me and he thinks he might have said, I'm starting to look around buildings to see if the Nazis are hiding to grab me. <laughs> and he says, uh, you know, let's have lunch. I'm going to lighten it up. How about a Nedix hot dog? And I say, only with an orange drink. We say we're famous for our uh, orange drink and a hot dog. And that's what we did that day. And they have so much soul searching. I originally named the book Growing Up Jewish in Newark in the 1930s. But I like the I, I like the title now. I really do. I love that title. It's it's a terrific title. Yeah. Suzanne wants to know if you went to many baseball games. I started going to baseball. I stopped going to baseball about three years ago. I don't get around much. I don't fly anymore. I'm still working for the paper because if I call someone, they'll answer my call. Um, I saw a lot of baseball games. I'll tell you a quick baseball show if we have time. I sneak into the ballpark. The deal was stay in the bleachers. The ushers won't bother you. Come in the grandstand, you're out of the park. I successfully sneaked into the grandstand that day. I got a scorecard I found on the ground. The guys walk into the bullpen. I lean over. I told you I was a snotty guy. I lean over and I said, give me a autograph. I had his autograph three times. I'm not going to name him. And I didn't realize ball players are people. Sometimes they're constipated. Sometimes they don't feel well. Sometimes they had a fight with their wife. So I'm saying, you could sign it. You could sign it. He takes it and tears it in half. Oh, now if it had been Toronto Maple Leaf or a Jersey City Giant, I could have been. One of my guys would do this to me. A woman comes, takes me by the hand, and leads me just by the third base dugout. I think she's going to throw me out of the park. She said, the whole bunch of women she says, you sit with these ladies, I'll be right back. She goes down, leans into the dugout, comes out with a baseball, walks up and says, this is for you. It's autographed by, by all of the Newark Bears. I can't believe this. I'm in love. And she said, do you know a player named George Sternweiss? And I said, Snuffy Sternweiss. Oh, boy, he's going to go to the Yankees. I know him. Uh, I waved to him all the time. She said, I'm Mrs. Sternweiss. And if you ever have any trouble getting into this ballpark, ladies, his name is Jerry. Help him out this summer because I know he's going to get in trouble again. Yeah, okay. Well, that, that's an awesome story, Suzanne says. And it was an awesome story. Um, uh, it's, she says baseball in Newark is what brought her here. She lives in Newark. Uh, so, oh, really? yeah, yeah. So. So anyway, I, I want to thank both of you, both. I want to thank you, Jerry, and I want to thank you, Guy. Uh, I will type the address, the Amazon page for ordering Jerry's book. This is the third time I've done it. I've done it twice. If somebody wants to buy, if anybody wants to buy his book, you can click on that link and order it through Amazon. Uh, and I thank both of you for being here tonight. Um, and Guy, thank you for all of your probing questions. Thank you to everyone who tuned in tonight. A recording of this interview will be available later on the library's YouTube and Facebook pages. Uh, good night, everyone. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Jerry. Thanks again. Okay, thank you.